Okay, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Let's start with a little bit of an introduction to Coco Town for those of you who haven't been with us before. Hello. So, uh, Coco Town, the parent company was founded in 1992. We started as a trading company for trading innovative specialty food processing machines. So, we primarily focused on making, you know, um, marketing machines for making South Indian food called Idli Dosa. And then we, we, over the years, we learned that people are using these machines for different uses. And then when recession hit in 2008, 2007, we realized <coughs> we need to change our focus on a, a different market, wider market, not focusing on a very narrow market. So then we, we you know, found out some customers have been using it for chocolate making, but there had to be MacGyver, so they had to modify the existing machines to rep or repurpose the machine to suit the chocolate making. So we said, okay, Coco Town will make the machine so you can focus on your art and we will take care of your equipment needs. So we always had a you know multi-pronged approach to sustainability. We wanted to make sure we are environmentally sustainable, business sustainability, and agricultural. Um, environmental. We wanted to make sure the machines are working for a longer time and we use very minimum plastics and we use only stainless steel, which is, a, and then as a business sustainability, we wanted to make sure our customers are uh, successful in their business. That's what, you know, and then agricultural sustainability, we wanted to make sure by giving the machines and more people making chocolate, they help the farmers. So we are, you know, that's why it was started. And then uh, this is just a small timeline. So 1994, we introduced the wet grinders. Even though our company was formed in 92, it took two years for us to decide which one we want to do it because we wanted to be an innovative company. And then in 2007, we started selling the commercial grinder for the chocolate industry. And then in 2009, we formed the company Coco Town. We registered as a separate uh, logo and everything. And then we have the patents for our machines. And then in 2020, again, the pandemic, uh, you know, uh, helped us to refocus because we looked at it. And uh, in US, we were fortunate with the government funding and other things for small businesses to stay afloat. But a lot of our customers in different countries, they didn't get any support. They had extended lockdowns. So we thought we should make use of this and educate them more. Earlier, we used to have that bean to bar workshop in 2014 to show people how to make chocolate. But then this, the webinar is giving us an opportunity to reach out the customers all over the world at the same time, uh, you know, giving them uh, information on the processes and everything with the real life examples. So that's why we started this Empowering Chocopreneur <laughs> webinars. So we are hoping, you know, with the vaccination and everything, the, you know, world will come back to the normal pace. We will still continue the uh, webinars, I think, because like I said, this one is uh, connecting more people. Uh, you know, when you have the in-person, only limited number of people can travel here. So we thank you for all your support because without your support, um, we cannot continue this. So, you know, thank you all. And IEC, thank you for, uh, you, know, you know, accepting to give the webinar today. And I just want to end with this. Loka, Samasta, Sukhino, Bhavantu. So may all the beings everywhere in the universe be happy and free. And the thoughts, words, and actions of my own life contribute in some way to the happiness and the freedom for all. Thank you. Stay safe and healthy. Now I'm going to hand over the mic to uh, Teresa. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mrs. Balu. I know we're having a little bit of technical difficulty. But I think uh, Dr. Ogata's presentation, we will we will be able to hear and see. Uh, so I'm going to do just a brief bit of housekeeping. I'll, I want to let you all know that we will be sending a recording uh, of the presentation today to everyone who registered. So don't worry about taking notes or you missed something. Uh, you will get a link to the recording. Also, we want to ask you to put your questions in the chat and uh, we will Answer, we will ask Dr. Ogata to answer your questions at the end. If there's a, a question that we can um, ask him in the, in the, during the presentation, we might do that, but probably we'll wait till the end. But go ahead and put your questions in the chat. And um, 
we will we will answer the questions. Okay, so what I would like to do um, before we start is just ask uh, Dr. Ogata to just tell us uh, a little bit about how he got into um, Coco and his passion for what he the presentation that he's going to share with us. Dr. Ogata. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation and my my uh, research started when I was a, a PhD student when I was uh, in at the University of California in Riverside. I started working with uh, ethnobotany and late, later started to uh, work with cacao and uh, I I started from ethnobotany, molecular biology, economy, anthropology, and now I, since um, 2002, I have been working, dealing with um, um, communities in indigenous areas, trying to um, uh, propose new alternatives for the economy of these people. Thank you so much, Dr. Agata. Well, with, with that, I'm going to turn the uh, floor over to you, and I I very much look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, you. Okay, I will share. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to thank the organizers of Coco Town for giving me this opportunity to talk with such a diverse audience from, from many countries. And today I will talk about when money grew on trees. For me, it is a very attractive title uh, to refer to the history of cacao, cocoa, chocolate, Teobroma cacao, or whatever name you want for this commodity. The title is not mine. It belongs uh, to René Mignon, who entitled his PhD thesis in 1955 to describe the importance of cacao in Mesoamerica. Today, I will take you through this journey for you to have the context about the importance of this Native American plant and, and it's different interactions with people. No matter where you live, if you are an entrepreneur, a chocolatier, or someone who simply likes to buy a chocolate bar. I will begin from a wide perspective to specific study cases with the intent of bringing you information for you to have a better idea as to why we are dealing with the worst ever ecological, economic, social, and health planetary crisis. In regard to cacao, I will bring you two sides of the coin. In one side, I will show you how popular methods of cacao cultivation and the production of chocolate are closely associated to this global crisis. You will see in this talk how cacao cultivation is used as no more than a global strategy for the control of societies, dispossession of land, exploitation of natural resources, and disqualification of the ways of living and non-occidental knowledge of the colonized countries. In the other side of the coin, I will show you how the cultivation of cacao can be used as a strategy for a rational management and, and use of high biodiversity ecosystems, conservation biology, welfare to local small cacao producers, and fair trade of cacao derivatives. I will start with a brief introduction on the relations among language, culture, biodiversity, and how this is important in the perception that we have of the world, the ways we make use of nature, 
and how tradi traditional knowledge might be crucial for present and future of human beings, not as societies, but as a biological species. After that, I will describe the biological cultural context of Mexico, why this is important, and show you some, some traits of the Olmec and the Maya cultures as complex, successful societies living in tropical rainforests. Then I will take you to the encounter between cacao and Europe and the European perception when they found out that money grew on trees. In the end, I will compare the production of cacao in the world and what we are doing working with the small cacao producers in Mexico. In this way, I will introduce the concept of ethnobotany, understood as the study and evaluation of botanical knowledge, which will be the thread to help us weave the tapestry that I will share with you today. I will start with this a question about why language is important and especially important in the context of this talk. Well, language is important because each language and dialect is the result of the perception, understanding, management, and ways of relation between people and nature. That is why. Just for you to have an overview of the different languages around the world, this is uh, the distribution of the different, almost 7,000 uh, um, languages around the world, meaning at least 7,000 of ways of interacting between people and nature. From almost 7,000 languages on earth, it is uh, shameful that half is not taught to children. And if we don't do something, it will disappear in our generation. Now, why this, the loss of languages is important? Well, it is important because when a language disappears, it takes with it the whole library of knowledge, relations, and ways of interaction between people in nature. In the case of Mexico, we have around 54 cultural groups, 293 different languages, 288 alive, five extinct, and around 8 million indigenous people. Just for you to have an idea, just the, the state of Oaxaca is such diverse that in just 92,000 square kilometers, there are uh, coexisting 157 languages and dialects. That is the amount of interaction, the different ways of perceiving, management, and using nature. Mexico is the second highest biocultural diversity in terms of the number of species, number of indigenous group, languages, and agricultural diversity. I am gonna focus on tropical rainforests. Tropical rainforests understood not only as the biodiversity, but the relation between bio biodiversity and Mesoamerican cultures. Why? Because we have several forgotten les lessons that will be the key to recover the know-how to rational use and conservation of high biodiversity ecosystems. As a result of the Mesoamerican interaction with biodiversity, up to now, there is no evidence of massive extinctions um, uh, from, uh, with the presence of Mesoamerican cultures before the arrival of the Spanish. However, this knowledge nowadays is still neglected. And in this way, 
what is happening now in Mexico? Well, what is happening now is a deep social inequality that brings us one of the richest men on, in the, on the planet. We have a very high uh, poverty with more than 55 million people in poverty from where at least 88.8 8. 8. 8.7 million living in extreme poverty. We have very high, high rates of deforestation. And for you to have a clearer idea how this development in tropical rainforest has been occurring since the 50s, from at least from the uh, last century, this is the development. Look, this is a, a mature natural a, a tropical rainforest that it is transformed into this. For sugar cane, citrus, banana, cattle, and this meaning predatory agricultural systems that are promoting more poverty, more environmental deterioration, more concentration of wealth in a few people, and cacao cultivation is now contributing to this environmental and cultural deterioration. However, we have to remember that at least between 70 and 80% of the food consumed in the world is produced under developed countries like Mexico, and this is done by around 570 million families which use only the labor, labor force of their own families to produce. Don't forget that. Because, however, poor people is blamed for all these ecological economic uh, uh, crisis. And even though, and besides, is accused of rapers, thieves, and narcotraffic dealers. However, people is not giving up. People, once capitalism destroyed the environment, social networks, values, identity, what is left for poor people to offer to the world? They are moving. And then in the case of Mexico, the, the labor, labor force is the main income for money to, uh, to Mexico with more than 40,000 million of dollars. So how to reverse this economical and ecological, social and health planetary problems? Well, we think we have to be, uh, keep going to the past. And in this way, I wanna show you the uh, mother of Mesoamerican cultures, how nothing is a chance, not at random, and how this culture was able to create complex societies living in this case in the Gulf of Mexico. This is the area where management of natural resources took place. And I will put you this example that nothing is um, um, at random. And for this, I will show you this, uh, uh, the Lord of Las Limas, a beautiful, um, a, a, a beautiful uh, piece that represents the God of corn and why this is important. It is important because it represents the celebration of domestication. It's the transformation of this grass who holds only one row of uh, seeds to transform it to transform into these 12, 10 rows, creating four surpluses to create complex societies. What happened deep in the tropical rainforest? These people was able to domesticate plants like this, cacao. And the knowledge and the concept of domestication they created is where they do not focus only in the species of interests, 
but the domestication of the forest itself. The Maya inherit many of these uh, features, characteristics, and they are one of the cultures from where we have more um, information, more evidence. Like this one, this guy is receiving a pot of foamy chocolate, as you can see in the image, and the representations are, as you can see uh, in this image, where cacao is playing a big role uh, in the association with animals like monkeys and squirrels. In this image, you can see in the, uh, the right part, there's a woman serving chocolate, um, making a foamy uh, uh, liquid. And in, in this image, you will see it in a, in a more clear way. I have to remember that uh, the foam was the most important of the drink in pre-Hispanic pre times, and there was no um, bitters to produce the foam. I want to show you just one example where uh, Fray Diego de Landa said that they make this sort, sort of foamy and delicious drink to celebrate the, their banquets. Let me, let me, uh, just let me, uh, a little bit, I will take out this, okay, sorry. And the, the Lacandon chocolates says that the grain are roasted and grind with a piece of vine called sukir to produce foam. The foam is the most delicious part of the drink. Well, working with chocolate, with uh, the Mazatec people, we found an interesting uh, discovery that I want to show, uh, uh, to share with you today. This is a woman, as you can see, she is serving only foam, as you can see, only foam, because that's the most delicious part. And the thing is that to produce the foam, we found that there is a plant involved this Asclepiadiaceae, which uh, has around 2,000 species, most of them poisonous, and people selected and domesticated this plant just to produce the foam that the Spanish didn't know they used. This is the fruit. Now I'm gonna talk about the, the um, relation between cacao and Europe. 1492, and then, they arrived. This is a group of mercenary in the name of the kings of Spain, king and queen of Spain, looking for the spices in India. They reach to a place where the societies were as, as complex and developed as in Europe. So they look around and they say goodbye in a very weird way. And one year later, Alexander VI, the Pope, divided the continent with a blessing from um, up to down to the right. Everything would be for the um, Portuguese and to the left would be for the Spanish. And that is how they divided the continent. Three issues they brought, of course, the peace of God and the king, and with it, they brought three relevant issues. The first one was to impose the racism and a supposedly inferiority of indigenous people. Then the astonishment about the diversified systems of, of production from the indigenous and a surprise and admiration before unknown biological diversity that they didn't have a vocabulary to name it. It was in May 9 of 1502, the third and last trip of Columbus, where he was uh, reaching Española from where he was governor and he was kicked out because he was a thief, he was a bad guy. He was, uh, uh, he got lost in traveling. He just ended up 
in the Gulf of Honduras. This is interesting because by the same time, there were a group of fellows traveling all around, around the Yucatan Peninsula where they were merchants from the Maya uh, group. And there they found with the Spaniards in the Guanaja, the Guanaja Island in the Gulf of Honduras. This is interesting because the son of Columbus said that when they brought the indigenous people into the ships, they, find, they found, uh, they brought fine cotton clothes, sticks, uh, sticks with sharp stone razor blades, which would be the equivalent to an AK-47 nowadays, a small copper axes, corn, money hot, some sort of English beer, whatever that means, and many of those almonds. Refers the son of Columbus that it seems that they are they are very valu valuable almonds, almonds, because when we, we brought them with all their goods aboard, I realized that when one of those almonds fell to the ground, everyone stopped to pick it up as, as if an eye had fell from their faces. And that was the encounter with the cacao, the cacao seeds. With this news is when it created the story about when money grew on trees. And it started with the notion nowadays that now we know the cacao was used as a drink since 1800 to one, uh, 1000 BC. And that the word cacao comes probably from cacawa, a Mijesoke word, probably the, the, the Olmec tongue. With this news spreading in, uh, um, in Europe, I want to show you how was the equivalent, how was CNN in colonial times and the equivalent of Don Lemon, for example. Well, the CNN in colonial times started with the chroniclers who received the information of the mercenaries and, 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 and priests, and they started to write the story of America and distribute it in all over Europe. This is one sample in why Europe became very interested as to why money grew on trees. It says, I'm well aware that people of feeble imagination will accuse me of being fantastic when I speak of trees bearing money. The CNN reporter from Colonial Times was Pedro Martir de Angleria. He was an Italian in origin who was uh, responsible of writing the fifth decade Novo Orbe in 1523. This is interesting because by uh, 10 years later, Gonzalo Fernandez de Oviedo, he was the chronicler from the crown. He is I think the most valuable and closest, uh, this, he has the, the closest description as to how the uh, cultivation of cacao and the management of tropical rain, rainforests took place in uh, pre-Hispanic times. He wrote this, first of all, I want to say they create or cultivate these trees which they appreciate utmost. They planted in fertile soil close to water, separated 10 to 12 feet away from each other so that they are well fed from the soil. The way they grow is in the shade where the sun cannot touch the air, only through few parts among the branches. That was the, the, the way in the sun, in the shade, 
that cacao grew because the sun usually hurt them in a way that the fruit becomes vain, do not get ripe, and dies. As a remedy, they plant other trees that Indians call yagaguit. Christians call them blackwood that grows almost twice to defend the cacao trees from the sun again with its branches and leaves. They trim the trees so that they will grow straight just for this purpose. So why is this important? Because it represents factual evidence of how is the way that these people manage tropical rainforest. Because tropical rainforest and the cacao plantation, the agroforestry systems, are the closest resemblance to a natural tropical rainforest and are an excellent model of conservation biology. For example, from around 3,000 species of trees in all Mesoamerica, around 600 are common to the whole region, from where around 240 species are useful species like uh, food, like a medicine, like timber, etc. cetera. With, uh, with the students, we searched 56 plantations where she found 30 families, 50 genera, and 66 species of trees with a density per hectare between 257 to 359 trees per hectare. The most interesting is that almost a third of the useful species are living within the cacao plantations. That is awesome. Besides these, the cacao agroforestry systems serves as corridor among natural spots of vegetation for birds, mammals, for amphibians, and obviously they grow uh, useful species. And now with commercial value, like this one that is uh, the, uh, the rubber. Nowadays, people inherit this knowledge and this is a way of explaining how important is the relation between people and tropical rainforest. You will see this, why it is important. ¿De dónde aprendiste tú el cultivo de cacao? De mi abuelo. Mi abuelo me enseñó cuando tenía yo nueve años. En ese entonces me enseñó a hacer un frijolar, me enseñó a barrer el machete y me dio tres matas de cacao. Y que esas matas de cacao las tenía yo que cultivar. Eso te dijo. Sí, las tenía yo que cultivar, tenía yo que podarle el, el pamón. No se lo tenía yo que dejar crecer y arriba tenía yo que tumbar el chupón y tratar bien a la marta que la tenía yo que colocar, que había que fertilizarla, que había que estar pendiente de ella. Y tres matas, esas matas se cargaron, se borraron de cacao. Y con esas matas yo estuve ahorrando. Después, así, ¿Ah, todo el cacao que, que salía de ahí, yo lo ponía a secar. Y ya que se juntaba todo el seco, ya lo, lo vendía y lo compraba en el escuela. Ah, y de ahí compré uno, unos marranitos y así me fui haciendo de cosas y cosas y aprendiendo pues a cultivar. ¿Y qué más te decía tu abuelo? Que el campo era, lo, ahora sí que lo que nos heredaban de tierra era para cuidarlo hasta lo último de los días que nosotros viviéramos aquí. Que la gente que vendía su terreno sus propiedades era gente que no tenía vida. Así no, no decía. Mira, ah, mi abuelo murió de 86 años y una semana antes de morir cosechó una milpa de 86 sacos. 
de maíz. Una semana antes de morir. Y él se levantaba a los portales, agarraba con un mecapal, se ponía así el, el, el portal de este lado y el mecapal así. Luego le daba la vuelta, ¡Ah! se lo impulsaba aquí y luego a la, se lo trababa de acá. Y yo ya le a la casa. Y así llegaba y al tapán. Así, y eso aprendiste tú de tu abuelo. Y ahí. Eres de los cultivadores que he conocido hoy más jóvenes. ¿Sabías eso? Y ya tienes 42 años. Sí, tengo 42 años. Y Mi hermano igual. Nada más que pues, ellos agarraron otro oficio. Pero ellos saben todo esto cultivo igual lo mismo. Ah. Yo estudié en un, una escuela cebeta en el 199 de Aldama y, este, y aprendí más. Porque aprendí a injertar, aprendí a usar los, los, este, los fertilizantes, uh -huh. los fungicidas, que en ese entonces pues era lo que se tiraba. Pero ya a partir del 2003 para acá empecé a conocer gente que traían el, el sistema orgánico. Empecé a aprender a hacer el insecol, las compostas. Más, más nutridas pues y este de ahí de ahí en adelante yo las empecé a hacer para ponerse la cacao el chayote o muchas siembras que he hecho a ver entonces platícame con tus palabras cuántas plantas útiles además del cacao tienes aquí en tu cacaotal aquí plantas útiles hay como una veinte no bueno, contamos ya más de 20. Sí. Plantas útiles son las que están... Con... Sí, por ejemplo, estos aguacates. Plantas de guayaba. Guayaba, ¿qué más tiene? Este, hay guayaba, naranja, este, zapote, chico zapote, hay este, mamey, hay papaya, y hay este, nance, mango, este, quiniquil, Tamarindo. No, de hambre no se van a morir. No, no gracias a Dios aquí de, de hambre no. Ah, quizás para en el momento que no tenga uno dinero, ¿no? En el, en el momento, pues, tiene que ir al médico prestando dinero. Uh -huh. Pero yo sé que tengo una mata de, vamos a decir, esa madera que está ahí, ¿no? En un momento dado, yo tengo que prestar dinero. ¿De dónde lo voy a regresar? No, ahí tengo un cedro que puedo vender, que ya está de uso. Tumbo ese y siembro 10. Muy bien. O ya tengo sembrado 10 para tumbar ese. Muy ah, bien. Así que ya tenés más esperanza. Para ¿Cómo te llamas? Roberto Emera, Copa Córdoba. De tengo aquí. un agropecuario y acabo de terminar la licenciatura en Derecho igual. Eso, muy bien. Okay, this is the way people inherit knowledge, and this is what we call traditional knowledge, which is the base for a rational use of natural resources. Now I am gonna go to the cacao cultivation in the world for you to see what is happening. Uh, the cacao cultivation only grows between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn. Nowadays, it is estimated about 10 million hectares, 55 point per, uh, million producers, 4 million tons a year. And the main producers are Ivory Coast, Ghana, Indonesia, Nigeria, Cameroon. In Latin America, 350,000. Mexico, 41,000 producers, producing around 30,000 tons. The important thing about this is what do cacao producers have in common around the world? What they have in common is that most of them produce in two or less hectares of land. They are the backbone to generate 120,000 million dollars a year on sales. However, most of them are living in extreme poverty. What do the five main cacao producers have in common? 
what they have in common is that they use occidental methods of, of exploiting biological diversity. Then the question is, why is that? Well, one of the main reasons is because none of these countries have the cultural background I just showed you on diversified agroforestry systems of cacao because these countries started the cultivation of cacao just after slavery was forbidden in America. There is a, a, a saying here in Mexico at least where people say that once they could not bring more slave into America, then they brought the plants to enslave the people in Africa. And now I will show you very brief the case of Ivory Coast, the main producer in the world. They have lost almost 120,000 hectares of natural protected areas. In these areas, 23 areas lost all primates. 13 out of 23 lost all primate populations. In five of them, half of the species has already disappeared. The elephant, the national emblem, is about to disappear due to the introduction of cacao in these natural protected areas. In the worst, the accusations of international kidnapping and abuse of children to force them to work in the cacao plantation. What is going in Mexico? In Mexico, since the 70s, we had around 11 million hectares of tropical rainforest, and nowadays we have about only one million. But what is the problem with this? The problem is that currently there is a strong pressure to adopt the African methods. That is to grow monocultures of cacao at sun to produce more per unit of area. Introduce high yield varieties but with very low quality of flavor. And the, the worst is that the uh, uh, schools promoted by the uh, chocolate companies offer the illusion of creating a small businessman peasants to generate economic richness for their own. The last piece of the bike of the Vice President Kamala Harris, she point out that they are interested in the cacao and the coffee from Mexico. That means to supply to the chocolate companies from the United States. Following the current global market economy, is there any chance to keep traditional agroforestry system of cacao as the one you saw, you saw to pursue the well-being of local communities and the conservation of tropical rainforests? The answer is very simple. No, it's not possible. So we have been studying the past. And before Spanish arrived, there were cacao agroforestry systems all over Mesoamerica in suitable uh, spaces. Among other things, because it was the money in Mesoamerica. This situation promoted the creativity of local people to adjust a series of ecotypes of cacao population in as many areas as possible all over Mesoamerica. I will show you how this work. I will start with the Yucatan Peninsula and this 
all written chronicle that we found. It sounds interesting, but how come this guy wrote about this very dry area where cacao is not possible to grow? Well, Professor Dr. Arturo Gomez Pompa in 1990 discovered cacao in the Yucatan Peninsula. He discovered it in the sinkholes that are created naturally along the Yucatan Peninsula. So what I did was to find out if this was a random finding of is, or if there were any pattern. So I started to search for the, in the sinkholes of the Yucatan Peninsula and I found this. This is a sinkhole that you can see, you can see in the left part, a very thin tree is a cacao tree. See the deep of the sinkhole. Those are the conditions to keep, uh, to keep enough humidity for these cacaos to grow. These are the ones very tiny, very small. So the question were, was, where can we find more? Fortunately, I found these uh, um, uh, accounts called the Suma de Visitas de Pueblos, which were an inventory from 970 towns written between 1531 to 1544. So I went through the, the, the Gulf of Mexico up to Tuxpan and from the Pacific side up to Colima. And I found in many of these places where nowadays there is no cacao plantations, I found these cacaos remnants in the backyards of the indigenous communities. This is cacao in the north of Veracruz, in the Gulf of Mexico. Cacao in the Totonacapa. These are the Totonac people where they uh, designed an ecotype adapted to the limits of its latitude distribution. See the size, the small. And they are the typical criollo, which we, which we, uh, we made uh, uh, chocolate, very high quality. We also searched in Tabasco, where there is a huge tradition. This uh, Senora Echeverria was the, uh, the promoter of uh, having a very, very nice, high quality uh, cacao. We also were looking deep in the tropical rainforest of the Lacandon tropical rainforest where this size of trees occur. And here we found these huge, huge trees of cacao. As you can see the, the, the fruit, look. Also in the uh, uh, Oaxaca area, we found this uh, diversity in summary we have a considerable diversity of cacao with a sort of different aroma and high quality flavors, like in the wines that we should not lose just because we want to produce a lot of cacao at sun. What are we doing then? We are trying to study the chain production of cacao to propose alternatives alternatives to benefit small producers, manufacture of high quality products, and reach informed consumers to do conservation biology. And I will show you these two study cases, how we transform grasslands into agroforestry systems, how we uh, prepare uh, the budget for a small uh, batches of, of for fermentation in the production of high quality chocolate. 
So we are going to show you how different things we can do. In our proposal, the transformation of cacao seeds into chocolate bars and its derivatives is a chain made of a series of links apparently designed as to be isolated from each other. Many of you uh, should know that only a few at the end chain are the ones who receive the main profits. In this way, in general, producers doesn't know where the seeds go, nor what it becomes. A small to medium manufacturers don't know where the seeds come from. And most consumers don't know either where the seeds coming from, how seeds are transformed into chocolate, and they even don't know what is, what is the real taste of chocolate. This is because the companies, the industry of chocolate has made chocolate synonymous with candy. The real taste is masked with high sugar, cross seeds, marmalades, etc. What we are trying to do is a methodological syncretism using tradi traditional knowledge with academic approaches. And what we are trying to do is to make a call to communities willing to develop new strategies to improve their quality of life, control their systems of production, defense of their territories and conservation of the natural patrimony by recovering rational methods of production, such as diversify agroforestry systems of cacao. And we think this is the way we can produce surpluses. Up to now, in Latin America, agroforestry systems have become very popular with more than 300 million hectares planted in all Latin America. This is a, a different uh, sort of agroforestry systems, among them cacao. The growth in the last 40 years has been an astonishment. See Peru, Colombia. In Mexico, we pretend to create one million hectares transforming grasslands into, into agroforestry systems. However, this situation hasn't changed the poverty in the region because it keeps it the same. So we try to uh, um, propose a specific project with people in, in, in this small town, again, in the Gulf of Mexico, in the state of Oaxaca. This is the Gulf of Mexico. And we started to work in uh, close to these dams that were built where they ejected uh, the uh, Chinantec and Mazatec people just in order to uh, uh, fill with water all this area. And these people just were left out, ejected from their own territories. And that dot, uh, red dot you see there, is the uh, area where we were working. We work with 19 Mazatec families. And what we are trying is to imitate local and regional communities trying to overcome centuries of, of being neglected and ejected from their territories. We are working with five basic principles proposed by David Barkin and, and Blanca Lemus. And the project is based from the beginning, from the design of the plantation. You can see the stars represent a, a chocolate plant. The letter Y uh, is the money hot. Platano means banana. Letter A means shade trees. Cocoite is a, a, another shade tree. So we designed the plantation, then held them how to trace in the field to the campesinos, held them to collect the plants and grow them in nurseries so that they don't have to buy anything other than the, the basics. And then they created their own nurseries and see, I will show you the transformation 
from a grassland. This is a grassland. We started to transform, to be transformed into a agroforestry system, diversified agroforestry system of cacao. These sticks that you see are the ones who um, uh, will be protecting the chocolate plants. These are manivores. This is the, the way the, the plantation is developing. Some campesinos decided to grow in the first stages corn, uh, squash, and that's how um, uh, the manihot is growing. This is seven months, eight months, and then the time of harvesting. There you go, and the, the uh, forest is uh, growing. These are some of the species that we incorporated, like this used for wrapping tamales. These are uh, fertilizing the, 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 the soil. These are edible plants, all of them to make, this is Theobroma bicolor. These are some from India introduced a long time ago. All of them are edible or timber uh, plants. So the first flowers show up, then the first fruits. And this is the grassland three years before, and this is the grassland three years later. As you can see, it is completely transformed. We produce enough shade as to protect the chocolate plants, you can see the, the shade uh, um, that is produced. And this is the way we transform in a period of three years. There is the fruit, as you can see, and this is how it looks, the plantation three years later. Up to this point, mission accomplished. Now the harvesting, how to do a good fermentation and dry process with the small batches. So we designed to use these uh, Enneken um, bags to make the fermentation of very small batches so that they put the, the seeds within these bags and hang it in the, uh, in the house and 24 hours later, they open it, they move and, and make the process control under these circumstances, as you can see. So with this, we have now the seeds. Now, another uh, project uh, was developed. This is in Tabasco, where they already have uh, plantations. And this is a little bit southern uh, Mexico. This is the red dot is the area where we were working. And I want to show you, I want to share with you this image because it's very interesting. The uh, dark areas are the plantation of cacao that uh, are disappearing and disappearing and disappearing. And the, the light areas are the uh, transform lands into cattle and sugar cane. So at this pace, the cacao plantations, even in Tabasco, tend to disappear because the influence of, of these uh, um, predatory systems of production. Here we we met with the Broca family. This guy is the, the head of a group of 11 uh, young people but this guy, when we went to, to work with them, they, I found out they had seven varieties in the same plantation. So what I proposed was to choose only one and make chocolate with it. However, here it appeared the usual suspects. And what we found is that the only way, the common way of doing chocolate all over the, the Southern Mexico, is like this, mixing cacao seeds 
with uh, sugar, and this is the grinder. And this is the way of preparing with these rings. And this is the only way. At the end, it becomes more like a weapon. If you get uh, uh, um, one of these tablets uh, on a head, you better go. So what we are trying to do is a different uh, uh, way of thinking. So what we can do, what we are trying to do is to change the rules of the game. We want to think and do different. Imagine, invent, propose new strategies for the benefit of small producers and the conservation of nature. So this is what people in Ghana is already doing, and I think is great. He says there cannot be future prosperity for the Ghanaian people in short, medium, or long term if we continue to maintain economic structures that are dependent on the production and exports of raw materials. This is the president of Ghana proposing this. And these are some of the comments. Has said Akufo Ado, the challenge of producing chocolate bars on a commercial scale. Is this realistic? Yes, though it's madly difficult. The obstacles, of course. But unless Ghana can crack the problem, many Ghanaians will be condemned to poverty in perpetuity. That is what uh, this guy from Financial Times says. And I think it's true not only for Ghana, but for all the producers around the world. What is the opinion of the colonizer? This is beautiful. When President Akufoado said, we will no longer sell cacao to Switzerland, see what the colonizer responded. It is quite simple. We need the raw materials and you have the raw materials. And then he said, it says, the resulting trade and business should, should benefit both countries. This principle is part of a mutual respect. Pay attention to that. Gold and cocoa can create work and wealth in both countries. This is what the president of Switzerland said. However, what is the reality? The reality, as Leslie showed in another seminar, the prices are just crazy for cocoa. Then Ivory Coast and Ghana tried to set an income, a differential income of 400 per ton, and even Akufo tried to explain why this was worth it. However, the produce the big companies decided to not do that. So buyers refused to pay off. Beans were piling in warehouses, in warehouses, and the countries were in a big trouble. So this is the quite simple. We need the raw materials and you have them. And this is the way there is the mutual respect between uh, Occidental countries and producers, colonizers and colonized countries, this is not good. So searching for alternatives, we started to think and design, design which will be the minimum operational unit to work. What, what is the smallest, the smallest scale where you can produce high quality chocolate. And in this uh, uh, sense, Henry Reimers is a, a, a founder of a, a, a factory in Ghana. He says, well, 200 years ago, most people were small holders in, in Europe. So turning, be turning beans into bars domestically is five times more valuable 
for uh, the people in Ghana. The problem is not the cocoa beans that are sold so cheaply. The problem is to process it. And that is when we started to decide to find out where we can find something, some alternatives. And it's when a Cocoa uh, Town Company appeared and they were uh, searching to focus, to switch to an industry where we had the ability to make a positive social impact. So they are trying to help uh, with the design of, of, um, um, of equipment for small batches as we were thinking and committed to becoming a pioneer in, the, in this kind of industry. So we decided to set this with this equipment in Mexico. And this is the initiative that we made between Universidad Veracruzana and the Instituto de Alta Repostería High Bakery uh, Quality uh, in, in Jalapa. So we got together and tried to do something different. So in the search of the know-how, the purpose was to design this kind, this variety of end products. So what we did is go to the communities and bring the information to the uh, uh, peasants, the farmers, and then bring them back to the laboratory and show them all the steps and all the advantages of, of processing the raw materials into an end product so, such as high quality chocolate. So we started to help them using the roaster, using the melanger, and then the tempering, the tempering uh, method. Oh, no. The same thing we did with the uh, our fellows in, in, in Tabasco, with these young people that in their lives have been in a kitchen, so they were only in the, in the farms. So they learned how to uh, make a, a tablets, see, how to temperate, to prepare tablets. And these are some of the end products. We also uh, uh, were collaborating with the designer to make the, uh, the, the envelopes. And these are the truffles. These are the bonbons. And these are the packaging. And um, we also look for uh, uh, complements because uh, people also uh, um, cultivate peanuts, sesame, uh, pumpkins. So we uh, decided to make these energetic bars using the seeds they produce and chocolate. And then the product is like this. And we started to target with the local um, market. This is the way. And in this way, we can change the perception of chocolate from local to the top of the chain of, of um, consumers. For example, the most famous chocolate in Mexico is this, this grandma chocolate. The uh, chemical analysis show that it is sugar with cacao flavor because around five to 7% of the content is cacao. The rest is sugar and oils. So we need to change this perception. And we, just to finish, we design with the help of influencers. I have the fortune to have a, a, a friend who is actor, Netflix, and many other uh, streaming uh, companies. And we made this call of attention for all the people interested in cacao and an awareness that cacao needs to be cultivated under certain rules in the shade and it has to uh, benefit the small producers that are the backbone 
of the whole chain. Algunas veces los humanos hacen las cosas bien. Yo soy una de ellas. Mi nombre, Cantado. Soy el resultado del sistema más sofisticado de domesticación de la selva lluviosa. Mi diseño comenzó hace por lo menos 3.000 años. Mis padres, los olmecas. Los mayas me nutrieron y cuidaron hasta llegar a ser uno de los árboles más importantes de la selva. Y mis semillas... Mis semillas se convirtieron en chocolate y en la moneda de Mesoamérica. He trascendido tiempo, culturas y aún estoy aquí para el placer de la gente de este planeta. Sin embargo, para mantenerme, los humanos de hoy necesitan seguir haciendo las cosas de la manera en que mis diseñadores lo hicieron. Los humanos de hoy necesitan aprender del pasado, hallar el balance donde ninguna especie es más importante que otra, sino el componente de un todo. La gente del pasado aprendió a usar la naturaleza de manera racional y a transmitir este conocimiento de generación en generación. Los humanos son reemplazables, la selva no. Yo soy la prueba de que los humanos pueden manejar ecosistemas de alta diversidad biológica de manera racional y dar a la humanidad una oportunidad para sobrevivir. Soy cacao para la alegría y gusto de los seres humanos. Okay, I think that is all that I wanted to share with you. And I really appreciate your patience uh, for um, waiting all this time. So I would be more than happy if you have any question that um, I could uh, answer to you. Thank you very much.